Well, good morning to everybody. One more good morning. Uh, I'm John Dubia, retired soldier, part of the team of AFSEA, the Naval Institute, privileged to be in AFSEA International now since I took off my active duty uniform, retired, still serving. The topic of today's panel, the budget clock is ticking. What does it mean? For those of you who uh, have just been on the exhibit floor and preceded that walk on the exhibit floor by listening to the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you got about six graduate credit hours of what's going on inside that five-sided building. And also what's going on or not going on, I can say that, in the rest of Washington. When you take a look at it and you listen to everything that was said, this panel is most appropriate to be the segue to the Vice Chairman's pitch. As far as the exhibit floor is concerned, a couple of admin announcements. Again, as you know, we have uh, team Naval Institute and AFC have had an engagement theater where commands are able to do a deeper dive into subjects that the commanders feel are real important, but we just could not get enough plenary sessions or panel sessions to be able to address them. The popularity of that engagement theater has continued to grow to the extent where this year we have three engagement theaters. The engagement theater, which you're from, all three on the exhibit floor. Do an engagement theater, then we have an engagement theater focused specifically on small business, and we have one focused on cyber. General Keith Alexander from Cybercom said he wanted to have a start on the program of cyber from his perspective and Cybercom's perspective. He wanted to have that here on the West Coast as a prelude to the uh, late June Cybercom conference that will take place in Baltimore. So you'll see early pieces of that uh, run under the tutelage of Mark Namer. And you also, on uh, Friday morning, will have a chance to hear the deputy commander of a Cybercom, Lieutenant General John Davis, United States Marine Corps, in a fireside chat with Mr. Rob Carey, the uh, Department of Defense Deputy CIO. We also, as we heard uh, Admiral Winterfeld talking about acquisition and the challenges thereof, uh, once again, by popular demand, we have, as brought out by Admiral Daly in this morning's opening session, a, an area we call Plug Fest bringing together some companies, two companies in academia, looking at an issue, having 48 hours to work it, and then come in with solution, proposed solution set or capability set. Take a look at that in the 2400 block, if you will, of what's going on on the exhibit floor. Could be very important. Industry pretty well so makes the idea, takes the idea of I want to be there, Take a look and see if you or your company want to be there for future plug fests, such as the one we'll be doing in our East Conference in Virginia Beach in May. It's now my pleasure to be able to introduce Professor Barney Rubel, the Dean of the Center of Naval uh, Warfare Studies at the United States Naval War College. I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Rubel and let him uh, talk about the esteemed panel that we have here. But when you take a look at Professor Rubel's background, it's awesome. 30-year Navy veteran, NROTC, University of Illinois, retired with the rank of captain. And then he's a naval aviator, A-7 Corsair, FNA-18, and his shore assignments really in the education world. When you say professor, don't take it lightly. Professor Rubel, you know, he graduated from both the Spanish Naval War College and the U.S. Naval War College. be interesting to hear his comparative notes on those two institutions. I know what he has to say from the Naval War College, but the Spanish War College could be an interesting uh, international <coughs> interface. He holds master's uh, degrees from Salve Regina University and from the Naval War College. When you take a look at his background, his thirst for education, his expert subject matter expertise in the area of educating the future of America, future leaders, 
through his role at the Naval War College, uh, he is absolutely tremendously qualified to be our moderator for today's panel. With that, please give a warm Naval Institute and FC International a uh, welcome to Professor Barney Rubel. Thank you, General. Uh, just as an aside, uh, there no longer exists a Spanish Naval War College. It's, uh, there's now a joint war college that the Spaniards have. Um, well, good morning and welcome to this panel one. Uh, the purpose of this conference is to focus on the, on the rebalancing of uh, the United States foreign policy and security policy on Asia and the Pacific. However, uh, such an examination uh, can't really take place validly uh, at this moment in time uh, without taking into account the financial plight of our, of our government and the political deadlock, which is both an effect and an exacerbating factor. Uh, we don't know yet how this uh, drama will play out on Capitol Hill, but how it does will determine whether the pivot to Asia is a true augmentation of U.S. capability uh, and influence or a, a simple shift in the net uh, vector of U.S. policy as a result of the drawdown in Afghanistan or whether it's a uh, shrinking residual of a resource depleted uh, strategy. So it's entirely appropriate at this conference's opening panel uh, that we address uh, the budget crisis. Um, however unpredictable the course of events in Congress, we do know that for the Navy, the perfect storm of a continuing resolution and a sequestration will produce an almost uh, $10 billion bogey uh, this year and similar reductions through the uh, FIDA. The fleet is under great pressure to be forward in many places, as uh, you may have heard uh, Sandy Winnefeld uh, talk about, uh, and you're all aware of the effects that this is having on the material condition of the fleet. We have, uh, for example, uh, I have one of my former uh, uh, officers who, and, and Wargaming went out, he's, a, he's CAG-17 now, he came back and was reporting that uh, like 60% of our Hornet fleet has over 6,000 airframe hours. And uh, <laughs> we're, uh, uh, we're burning through them. Um, and so uh, if budget pressure forces a cut to the F-35, it's not clear that any reduction in Middle East carrier deployments would uh, avert uh, thinly populated uh, carrier decks in the future. Uh, you kind of get the picture of flight, a fleet that may or may not be able to support the rebalance to the Pacific as time goes on. Now, my remarks are not meant to engender pessimism and only to highlight the importance of this panel subject. We have here today uh, four panelists that are uh, very well qualified to spearhead the discussion this morning. Uh, since he gave a bio, I feel compelled to talk okay. about you guys' bios a bit. Uh, our, our first up is uh, Vice Admiral uh, Terry Blake, uh, USNA 1975, a surface warfare officer. Uh, he's commanded USS O'Brien the cruiser Normandy, and carrier strike group 11. Shore-based uh, uh, assignments have primarily uh, had to do with uh, finance and budget, uh, although he's a graduate of the National War College, has a uh, master's in finance from the PG school, and uh, a number of uh, uh, budget-related assignments have cult culminated ultimately in being uh, deputy CNO for um, resources and integration. Just graduated from that. Um, our second uh, panelist is uh, Rear Admiral Retired Tony Langerich. He's currently with Oracle, but uh, he was uh, formerly Vice Commander of NAVC. He's from Redlands, California. <coughs> uh, got his commission through the Navy ROTC unit, University of Colorado. Uh, did initial sea duty on a series of tin cans. And uh, then went EDO and uh, worked his way uh, through a number of uh, program offices, commanded the Naval Electronic uh, Engineering Center Charleston, put into commission the Naval Command and Control and Ocean Surveillance Center in Charleston, and then as a flag he was uh, Director of Installations and Logistics for Spay War, uh, Director of Industrial Capability and Maintenance and Policy and Acquisition Logistics, and then finally Vice Commander of, of NAVC. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Ron O'Rourke of the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, everybody should know Mr. O'Rourke. He's, he's been at a, uh, a number of functions, produced a number of articles uh, on uh, naval matters for Congress. 
He's a uh, Phi Beta Kappa uh, graduate of Johns Hopkins University, has a master's from uh, the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, in 1996, he received a Distinguished Service Award. That's the highest uh, civilian uh, award uh, for his uh, analytic uh, efforts in Congress. And he was also the winner of the uh, Naval Institute Arleigh Burke Essay Contest at one point. And then finally, we have uh, Ms. Corey Shockey, uh, who's a senior national security researcher at uh, uh, the Hoover Institute, uh, Stanford uh, University. Uh, she served in a number of important posts, uh, such as direct Deputy Director for Policy Planning in the State Department, uh, Director of Defense Strategy and Requirements on the National Security Council during President Bush's first term, and uh, among other uh, accomplishments, had a hand in creating NATO's Allied Command Transfer Transformation. She has held the Distinguished Chair of International Security Studies at West Point and served on the faculties of Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies, Maryland School of Public Affairs, and NDU. Um, and she also is on the a number of boards, including the Journal of, of Orbis. So we have a good lineup of speakers this morning. I'm going to ask each to uh, give a short introductory uh, set of remarks, uh, five to ten minutes, and then uh, we'll, we'll let them all have their say, and then I'll ask for questions. Uh, there are standing mics, so if you have a question, uh, uh, raise your hand and then come to the mic, and uh, we'll call on you. Um, I would prefer that you concoct questions in your mind. Uh, this is not an oral blog. And so uh, I would prefer not to have extended uh, stream of consciousness uh, statements here. Uh, so please uh, uh, compose uh, good questions for our panel, hard ones, because I'm sure they can answer them. With that, I'll turn it over to Vice Admiral Boyd. Good morning. Uh, for uh, full disclosure, uh, I'm the former NA. As of uh, last month, Al Myers, who was out here as Air Forces, took my spot. So I'm a lot happier and he's a lot sadder. Uh, and uh, actually, this is my, uh, my last official act uh, as I retire this uh, Friday. Um, just to sort of set the, uh, the scene for you, uh, I've been a flag for 10 years, about, uh, and in that time, I've spent essentially eight years in the building, in the Pentagon, uh, dealing with money, uh, culminating in the, uh, the N8 job. And in fact, I've done, uh, with, since getting my master's in finance at the Naval Postgraduate School, I've, I've gotten, I've spent all my subsequent tours in the building and money. So uh, I've, I've, I was there for the uh, first peace dividend as a lieutenant commander. And uh, it, it seems that uh, every year as we went forward, I'd say, well, it can't get any worse than this. Yet it always manages to. And uh, it's, it's an amazing process uh, back there in the building. Uh, to talk about what's currently going on, you've got uh, basically uh, two events which are creating a significant amount of uncertainty uh, back in Washington, D.C. That's the CR and sequestration. And I think you have to look at them. Uh, in, in, in the past, we have dealt with things, whether it was the peace dividend, it was efficiencies, or uh, whatever the, uh, the, uh, the, the um, statement of the day happened to be. We, had, we have dealt with that over, over a period of time. But this year, uh, I would tell you, it is significantly different because of the fact you've got two significant events coming and they're combining. The first is the CR. If you look at the CR and you see how it's playing out, uh, that alone is going to have a significant effect on how we're doing business. The CR, is, is, as we look at it right now, is going to give us about a $4.6 billion uh, shortfall. Part of that is in growth, about, uh, about, uh, and part of it is just in the fact that there's a difference between the, uh, the budget that we thought we were going to have and how we're operating under the CR based on the $12. And so that creates a certain amount of churn for us. And because we're operating under a CR, we have a, a lot of the limitations that you all are known about, whether it's new starts or uh, it is a transfer authority, which you don't have. So there are a number of limitations being placed as we're putting the budgets together. The second is sequestration. When you look at sequestration, if you, as, as it plays out right now, that could be in, in round numbers around uh, $4.1 billion for the Navy. And so each of the services are having to deal with the issue as it's coming forward. And each of us are coming from a different perspective because over the last 10 years, we've had to deal with budgets from a different perspective. You know, excuse me. We've had uh, the two land wars. 
uh, we are trying to uh, line everything up. Uh, to give you an example of how things have been different, uh, most people don't realize that in that 10-year period of time, uh, the Navy has gone from a force of approximately 376,000 down to uh, right now around 325,000. So we were actually in a period of contraction as far as personnel went. Uh, the other services, the Air Force was also in a period of contraction, not as great as the Navy's. Uh, the Marine Corps and the Army, because of the war, were expanding and, and rightfully so. So that's what I say is we were sort of all in the different places we came forward. So when we start dealing with things like the sequestration and, and the CR, we, we are all coming at it from a, from a different perspective. I would tell you, and you've all seen the articles that have uh, been run uh, this past weekend, uh, there are no easy solutions left for us to deal with. Uh, we, uh, you know, some people used to say, oh, we'll just get the low-hanging fruit. Well, I will tell you, there is no low-hanging fruit. The locusts have been through the field, all right? There's lucky some, in some cases the trees are still standing. Uh, and so there are no easy solutions. We can't just do as we have done in the past, come up with a way to uh, finesse uh, the continuing program. Someone once said that, you know, if you're in a crisis, make sure that you are able to uh, take advantage of what you're dealing with. And I think that's one thing we have to look at today. You look, if you were in the room and you listened to Admiral Winnefeld this morning, uh, he essentially said, we are in a different place and we need to understand what we're going to do. I will tell you, when we were putting the budget together, we based it on a strategy-based budget, not a budget-based strategy. So we were going, as we went forward, we said we will take the strategy, we will take what we have in the budget, and we will apply it to it. We won't go the other way. And I think that's what we have to keep in mind as we go forward. You have a strategy, what, based on the dollars you're given, how do you apply that strategy, and what do you have at the end of the day? And then what can you no longer afford? Uh, you can no longer continue along the line that we've ju uh, just gone down. Uh, it's, it's impossible for us to continue along that path. So we've got to, uh, you've come to a point. I would, I would put it in terms of what you're de seeing us dealing with right now. If DOD were a super tanker, uh, they basically put a course correction in. So we have thrown the rudder over, and they are starting to make a course shift. So time is a factor in this. If it's decided that we want to go back to what we do, you can't just take the super tanker and turn it on a dime. You're going to have to uh, bring it back on course. So the rudder's been thrown over, and the, sh the, st the ship is starting to change course. So even, uh, and as I said, uh, the, uh, the, as more time passes, the harder it's going to be for you to get back on it. So what we have attempted to do as we're going forward here is we've looked at things like, what is it prudent to do? And what are things that we can do that in the long term could be reversible, that we could pull back to the original course? And that's sort of the situation uh, that we're in today as you're going forward. And I, I recognize more than probably most that there is a tremendous amount of uncertainty out there. But I would tell you that uh, I think that uh, it is not going to be uh, resolved uh, anytime soon in that once you've shifted that rudder over, it's going to take you a while to get that rudder back if you decide to go back to your original course, whatever it was on. With that, I think I'll, I'll turn it over to the uh, next panel member because I'm sure I just want to sort of give you ideas uh, to put out there. But the two things I would, I'd ask you to take away is as you look at the list of <clears throat> uh, 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 items which, there, which we are considering to do, the question is uh, what, if that item is so egregious, then what would you substitute in place for it? Because you're still going to have to come up with the dollars at the end of the day. When I used to go over to testify on the Hill, and they would ask me about an individual program, I would tell them, I can handle, I can solve any issue in isolation. Where it becomes difficult is when I have to deal with it across the entire portfolio. Uh, and then that's where the tough decisions have to be made. If you, uh, anything in isolation can be solved, especially with, this, with the size of the budget we have. But when you say, I want to do it across the entire portfolio, I want to balance it, I want to match it to a strategy, that's when you have to make the tough decisions. Terry, thanks for turning it over. Uh, I am, uh, first off, not a budget guy, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn at one time. Uh, that said, I, I did have three years in OpNav as the resource sponsor for uh, industrial maintenance at a time when Emma Clark was turning that uh, office into the fleet readiness resource uh, office, and we were taking in all the uh, requirements for maintenance and operations of all aircraft ships and submarines. 
And so uh, my hat's off to you, sir, for that long service of toiling in that vineyard because there's, there's no, there's, there's no uh, uh, easy way to say how hard that is and have folks understand it. The, the midnight challenges when, when the comptrollers would call you up and if you weren't there at midnight, your program got cut. I remember those well. You, you might go back to that. It, it's a matter of stamina. Um, so let me just say a word before I go to where I want to about, about the larger budget crisis because I'm certainly not in government now and I'm certainly not in a position to talk about the larger crisis. We, what we did know and then and now as you look at, at the ships and the airplanes is if you don't do the, the regular scheduled maintenance on the deep hard things to do, you eat up the life, the expected life of those assets very, very quickly. Forget the operations of them. When you plan to buy a ship and run it for 35 to 50 years, you must do the maintenance. We continually struggle with what is the right level of maintenance based on the operations, and we continually struggle with trying to figure out exactly how much that should cost. And I think that's a very, very difficult calculation. Certainly all the maintainers want more money, it should, you know, let's do it right the first time and, and how much you can afford. But at the end of the day, the resources that our men and women operate and fly uh, and, and use in the field uh, depends on uh, our ability to, to keep those resources available to them in a material way, and that's, that's a very difficult thing. Uh, but we learned then, and I'm certain they, they repeat that to you every day. So I'll get, get off that horse for a second and go back to what I, I, I think I can talk about. Uh, as you said, a, a, a good crisis is, is a terrible thing to waste, uh, and the clock is ticking, and the window of opportunity may be closing on us, I think, in a couple of ways. I want to talk a bit about information business and where I think that will go as a result of the, uh, the, the budget uh, uh, challenges that are in front of us. And when I talk about the information business, I do that because we're certainly at a conference that's about information, but I want to be fairly specific. Uh, let's take out the ISR stuff because innovation and nifty things at the surveillance end and the sensor end I think are really wonderful. Uh, let's take out the C2 end that talks about situational awarenesses and, and how you build common operating pictures, and let's talk about the information infrastructure that's underneath it uh, for a minute in a construct where budgets are declining. And if you go back to where commercial industries were, not an IT industry, but commercial industries, uh, banking industry or, or the manufacturing industry, the production industry, the maintenance, all those industries, about three years ago, they recognized, for a number of reasons, that budgets were gone. Uh, there was no money to reinvest in things. Uh, things were becoming really critical. And they looked around at their information infrastructure, and they asked the question, how much is it costing me to actually own, operate, maintain my own infrastructure? And those uh, questions finally boiled or bubbled up into the IT industry writ large, and I think forced the industry to rethink about what it was going to bring to the table in terms of future product sets. Now, you know, we're an industry like everybody else. We look at where, where's the market going, what can I do, and what can I sell into the market. And the good news is technologies, the actual chips and tape and everything else, all those advances were ripe for harvesting. And the industry had changed itself into what I'll call today largely the ability to deliver service on demand as opposed to uh, uh, the ability to build your own, operate your own, and manage your own. I think there's, a, there's an opportunity here that fits well with the, the, the budget structure, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. So uh, commercial industry put a great demand on the information industry. The information industry took advantage of technologies and changed. And what you find today in commercial industries, for the most part, is demand that says, I don't want to open up, own and operate it. I want to, for lack of a better word, lease it or rent it. I want X as a service. I either want the platform, the infrastructure, the software. You might call it a cloud. I, I don't particularly like that word because it's too amorphous. It, it is a set of services which you can choose to buy, rent, lease, or operate yourself. If I look at where we're at in the budget world today inside of DOD I, I, and, and the information world that DOD is in, I'm struck by a number of things. The, the money's gone. It's not the, you know, the, the, op, the operative words to save money it does, doesn't apply anymore. The money's gone. The question that they ask me is, don't tell me how to get better, don't tell me how to get faster, don't tell me what new things you got to the table. Tell me how you can operate the few things I intend to continue to operate at less cost than it's costing me today. And oh, by the way, don't have a CapEx in front of it. So think back to what we did for industries at large in the commercial space is how do you take the CapEx problem out of it, how do you take the ownership problem, and I'll come back to that at the end here. The uh, um, DOD then, 
in my experience as a, as a vice commander and, in, and in, uh, inside of watching the IT, has struggled with, as many industry do, this ownership question. I need to own and operate my own piece inside my silo. Um, I think that's at a position where it can be easily broken now. And I say that because what I sense inside of DOD is a great maturity among the leadership who understand that it is not uh, it is important not to do some things. They're comfortable with the notion that service can be delivered to you in uh, lots of different ways. Why? Because we as, as consumers get it on our laptop, we get it on our iPads, we get it on whatever we've got. It, the information and the ability to do work comes to us, unless we're in a very tactile business, comes to us in a variety of ways and we don't know what the infrastructure behind that is. In fact, we don't care. So from a consumer point of view inside the sailor environment, speaking mostly as a business type environment as opposed to a tactical combat system, so not going there. Um, very comfortable with the notion that I can do what I need and I don't have to own the infrastructure underneath. The leadership has come through about 10 years or 15 years of industry telling them you ought to be able to, to make broad and bold decisions about what you don't need and what you can collapse and what parts of the, of the, the fundamental DOD infrastructure look the same. Finance over here might be a little bit different than finance over here, but it's 85% common. Logistics over here might look like logistics over here, but it's 85% common, and we ought to be able to do something about that. I sense a boldness, a comfortableness on the part of DOD's leadership to say, yes, let's do, it is the same. 85% is good enough, let's go do something about it. I, I think they could very easily make that next step to actually make those happen and not suffer considerable pain. Maybe some loss in capability at the edges, but uh, not suffer considerable pain. The trick is, how do you do that without having to instantiate costs everywhere for everybody to pick it back up? Go back to where the commercial marketplace is. Software as a service, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and the ability to lease that service rather than own, operate it, and manage it on your own. You take advantage of scale, where the industry is doing that for large, large companies, uh, and a, across a broad customer base. So if patches, fixes, all those sorts of things become available at scale and are inst instantly available. I do believe the uh, uh, DOD infrastructure will want to own itself, that is, own it meaning in my facilities, under my security environment, do all those things, but they won't necessarily need to own the hardware. They won't necessarily have to uh, license everything on a bit-by-bit -bit basis. You see them going to enterprise licenses. So, budgets disappearing, confidence on the part of leadership that says I can go there and the pain is tolerable, and industry has now put into the, the information industry, now has in place the vehicles and the mechanisms to deliver service without the CapEx ownership costs in front. So what remains to be done? What remains to be done is to create the business model, both delivered from the, the, the industry side and the government side to understand what delivery of X as a service should cost and how you trace that out for the life cycle and make the trade off at what point does it become effective for me to either lease it or own it or operate it. And the, and the ability of controllers like yourself, sir, and others to build those models and say this is the construct under which I, I will actually accept that kind of a uh, notion from industry. And the ability of industry to make, in fact, contractual arrangements that allow that to happen. Much easier on the commercial side, now we have to translate it into the DOD side. So a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. I think there's opportunity here to operate the fundamental things they need to operate at cost less than is operable to operating today. I say that on behalf of the industry writ large. I think we're there. And I think there's great confidence on the part of the leadership in DOD that that can be done. So I kind of expect to go there. So I, you know, what's next? I think that can be next and is easily achievable. So thank you. On easy. I should just mention at the outset uh, the usual disclaimer that these remarks are my own and don't necessarily reflect those of my employer. Just as a small correction, I don't work for the Congressional Budget Office. I work for its sister agency, the Congressional Research Service. Uh, I keyed off of the title for the uh, presentation today. The clock is ticking. What does it mean? And uh, as one of the other speakers mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, to start off, it means uh, considerable planning uncertainty for both uh, government officials and program managers and for uh, the private sector. Uh, if you want to simplify uh, the range of possibilities that we face for where FY13 spending 
uh, might go as a consequence of what unfolds over the next two months, there are four basic possibilities. We will either have the CR extended at FY12 funding levels or it will be replaced by an appropriations vehicle of some kind that uh, resembles the marked up versions of the <coughs> FY13 uh, budget submission. And at the same time, we will either have a sequester or not. So if you take both of those things and there's four basic scenarios that are created and there are variations off of that if you want to create more branching points. Uh, but earlier this month, uh, the comptroller at DOD, Robert Hale, said, in three decades of working in and around the defense budget, I've never seen a period featuring any greater budgetary uncertainty than we're looking at over the next few months and through March. And, and I've worked in the business for almost 30 years myself, and uh, I would say uh, that that's pretty much my view as well. Just trying to figure out what all the different permutations are has been uh, a challenge. Uh, and so the first thing it means is uh, considerable planning uncertainty for both government officials and industry. Another thing that it means is anxiety among uh, civilian employees in the Navy in this case, or in DOD generally, about the possibility of furloughs, and anxiety among private sector workers about the possibilities uh, of layoffs. Another thing it, it means is uh, diseconomies uh, being introduced into uh, budget execution. Uh, the Navy's taking steps right now to slow down the obligation of its O&M money, and that is uh, getting them into actions that uh, uh, can preserve budget headroom now, but at the expense of doing things on schedule that can uh, increase costs and make things less efficient down the road. Uh, we may get into a scenario of having to reduce procurement rates from what are planned in the FY13 budget, which can lead to higher unit prices. We could have delays in the awarding of multi-year procurement contracts that were scheduled to start in FY13. Uh, this will have an impact, uh, things like this could have an impact on industry, uh, and one thing to possibly uh, watch in particular would be the impact on smaller supplier firms that uh, don't have pockets that are quite as deep as those as the uh, larger contractors. Uh, another thing that it will mean, and it's been alluded to earlier, are uh, impacts on readiness, uh, especially uh, uh, when the ship and aircraft maintenance availabilities are canceled starting on, FY, uh, on February 15, if that's what happens. And it's worth noting that these disruptions in the maintenance schedule uh, would come just as the surface community is trying to dig itself out of a maintenance and readiness hole that it had uh, uh, fallen into over the last 10 years or so. So just as the Navy was trying to turn the corner on surface ship uh, material readiness, uh, this would happen and further complicate the Navy's ability to recover from that situation. Another thing it could mean is that we uh, might be, if these reductions continue long enough through the fiscal year uh, and, the, uh, and we have uh, these cutbacks on operations and forward deployments, is that we could run a possible experiment on the consequences of reduced naval forward presence, although the Navy is working to avoid this. Um, that could have two different generic categories of outcomes that reduced presence in some region might lead to a regional instability or crisis, in which case it could generate a cost to respond to that that could uh, overwhelm the savings that were uh, uh, generated by not deploying in the first place. Or conversely, you could have reduce naval forward presence in one of these regions and, uh, and nothing happens uh, uh, untoward. And that could then influence views on the value of naval forward presence, uh, which in turn could calculate, uh, uh, could influence people's calculations on future uh, naval size in the future. Uh, another thing that will happen is that it could uh, influence the perceptions among foreign uh, political and military leaders about U.S. commitment and reliability, especially in the regions where uh, these forward deployments may be cut back. And among other things, it could affect perceptions in the Asia-Pacific region regarding the U.S. follow-through on the announced strategic rebalancing. All these things would happen or could happen depending on which scenario plays out over the next two months regarding the level and composition of spending during FY13. 
But it's worth remembering as we focus on uh, this immediate situation before us that even once we get through that, we would then face the situation of the lower budget caps for FY14 and subsequent years that are called out in the budget control agreement. And uh, if it turns out that DOD spending uh, follows uh, that lower path as opposed to something closer to the top line that you see in the FY13 budget submission, uh, then uh, Navy leaders have warned that we are looking at the eventual uh, situation of a Navy that is considerably smaller uh, than what we have today. Uh, many people expect that the Navy will do proportionately better in the allocation of DOD resources in years ahead, uh, in large part because of the strategic rebalancing, but whether that is enough to fully offset for the Navy the effects of an overall reduction in the DOD top line, I think, is another question. And Navy officials have now been uh, quoted publicly on multiple occasions as saying that in their view, uh, if we go toward the uh, lower budget caps in the remaining years of the Budget Control Act period that we would be uh, working our way toward an eventual fleet closer to 230-something ships as opposed to the 280-something that we have today. And that in turn would raise uh, further questions about uh, what kind of strategy such a fleet could support and among other things what uh, implications this might have for the U.S. ability to implement the strategic rebalancing toward the Asia-Pacific. Thank you. Uh, so I, too, uh, took my lead from the title uh, that uh, the clock is ticking, what does it mean? And it seems to me pretty obvious that if the clock is ticking, what it means is that the bomb is about to go off, right? And that's actually where we are. The bomb is about to go off. DOD has been in denial for almost 18 months about the fact that this is where we were going to end up. I, I don't mean it as a criticism of you, Admiral. It's the, it is the leadership decision. Um, so the politics have dictated that this is actually the glide path we are headed towards, dramatic reductions in defense spending over an era of probably 10 years. Whether or not the Budget Control Act remains the governing law of the land, the politics array themselves in that way. That's the first point that I would make and I'll come back to. The second is that the DOD leadership, and again, Admiral, I don't mean you, I mean Secretary Panetta and OMB and the White House, have made a set of choices that have actually aggravated the budget problem. Um, so, just for example, to develop a defense strategy that is unexecutable even if any changes come to the budget when it's clear changes are coming to the budget, right? When Secretary, Secretary Panetta rolled out his defense guidance, he explicitly said this will be unexecutable if there are any further cuts to defense. On practically the same week, the president was announcing that he wanted to take another $400 billion out of the defense budget. Why do you build a defense strategy that is unexecutable based on where the president is heading and do no excursions, no uh, alternatives that, for example, suggest if sequestration goes into effect, here's how we would best manage it and here's how we would have to manage it within constraints that Congress currently provides. OMB issued programmatic guidance to the, all the government departments that they should continue to operate as though the Budget Control Act was not going to go into effect. They did this when, uh, let's see, you have the failure of the budget negotiations in August of 2011. You have the super committee fail to make a grand bargain. You have the president saying he thinks he sees no reason we can't cut another $400 billion out of defense. Uh, you have... What am I missing of the major milestones of political fecklessness that bring us to this, uh, uh, to this space? So you have political choices that get made about how to handle this. And the choices were to magnify the pressure on Congress to never <laughs> let budget reductions go into effect. And uh, I remember the milestone I let past. Uh, when Republicans, when conservatives were forced to choose between protecting defense spending or bringing government spending down, they chose to bring government spending down, right? 
Budget Control Act goes into effect. So I'm not sure where DOD thought the political salvation was going to come from on this. For liberals, they are not going to get bigger cuts to defense from any other law that's going to come into effect to bring government spending down. And for our conservatives, they are not going to get any other political deal that forces, especially in this administration, that forces 50% of the budget cuts onto domestic programs. So the political logic takes you to where you are, and I predict that will be immutable for a pretty substantial period of time. In fact, uh, it seems to me mysterious why DOD isn't planning on the basis that the sequestration top line um, and its children are what we are going to be living with for a decade of austerity. Um, the third thing I would say is that um, the, in the panic to meet the top line figures, uh, we are in fact going to squander a crisis, I predict, Admiral, uh, because if you have to do this now, 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 you're going to cut, of course, all the things you can cut now. Um, and those things are going to hurt an awful lot, and you're going to cut sinew and, and chip into the bone. If I were advising the Defense Department, what I would advise them to do is develop a budget consistent with the sequestration top line across a decade. So we will save you $50 billion a year for the next 10 years make some big near-term cuts. I would actually make them consistent with the Panetta strategy. It seems to me a sensible one. And have that buy you the space to go after the drivers of costs in the defense budget, many of which are in the personnel accounts, um, and the others of which are in the procurement system. We actually should use the coming 10 years of austerity when Congress may from time to time occasionally feel guilty about what they are doing to go after why it is the American defense establishment is so expensive in getting things done. We're terrific in terms of effectiveness, but I think Admiral Mullen was right. We have raised a generation of military leaders who have actually never operated in circumstances of austerity. And as I look across the service budgets, I think with with applause for Admiral Clark, I do think the Navy in the last 10 years has done a terrific job of anticipating what was coming, the choice to send lots of um, sailors ashore uh, for it, during the wars that were being fighting. I think that was a great choice. It positioned the Navy extraordinarily well. You guys lead turn to the personnel issues. But we do actually um, have an unaffordable all-volunteer force. We cannot continue to have the force we have. We have to rethink retirement packages. We have to rethink benefit programs. We have to rethink medical care. Otherwise, we are going to end up, as, as Arnold Panaro, the chairman of the Defense Budget Board, said, we are gonna, the Defense Department is going to be an organization that runs entitlement programs and occasionally kills a terrorist. Um, we need to bring our... The problem that we have in the general budget in the United States, the federal budget in the United States, is that entitlement programs are driving out discretionary spending. And if, God forbid, interest rates go up, the service on our debt is also going to drive out everything discretionary that we want to do. Internal to the defense program, we also have a guns versus butter challenge. And the rate at which uh, the personnel accounts have been growing in the last 10 years is understandable when you are trying to recruit and retain a talented, in particular a talented ground force while you are fighting two wars. It makes a lot of sense to, to make those spending choices. When the president has, uh, has declared that the tide of war is receding and is on a path to, to having ended one and two and the other, I think it raises the question of whether the personnel accounts must always continue to go the direction they are going when the drivers of why you did that have changed dramatically. And I don't think actually we are going to end up with a Navy capable of executing the strategy 
even the current strategy, much less the pivot to the Pacific, unless we get our hands around the entitlement programs and unless we get our hands around the absolutely skyrocketing cost of buying what we need to buy. Um, so, uh, which brings us back to the management choices, because one of the things that pulling the rabbit out of your hat at the last minute to say, oh my God, we have to make a year's worth of cuts in the space of the six months remaining in the fiscal year, and oh my God, next year's not gonna be any better, and um, as far as we can see, the tide, the slope of the line is growing flat and maybe even dipping instead of going up, if you make your choices at the last minute, Congress, the public, can't evaluate exactly what you mentioned, Admiral, which is uh, you can solve any of these things in isolation. You can make cuts in isolation, but you can't assess risk over the breadth of the strategy about how does having too few ships in the Navy affect our ability to do this and do that and do other things. So the fact that DOD held off having a conversation about sequestration budgets and where we would accept risk means we are gonna end up with a budget that doesn't balance risk particularly well. well I hope I'm wrong as a taxpayer, as an American, I hope I'm wrong, <laughs> but I would be willing to bet a couple of months mortgage that what we are gonna end up with is big gaping holes of places where it is easy to cut money in the near term but you have not balanced that risk in other parts of the program. Lastly, where would I accept risk if I had to do it? Uh, here are the places in the near term I would free up that money. Army end strength, right? In addition to the fact that the war in Iraq is over and the president is just about to write off the war in Afghanistan, I think it exceedingly unlikely that a political leadership of either stripe would choose in the coming 10 years to fight a counterinsurgency campaign on a large scale, to fight a sustained land war. I, I think we are actually in the position that American governments were in after Vietnam, where they're, this may be the best option, but they are simply not gonna choose it. And they're not gonna choose it for a long time. So where I would accept risk is in the size of the ground forces, and in particularly in the size of the army. I would optimize to what Panetta says the strategy is, Right? The pivot to Pacific, the, the have the Marine Corps be the force that kicks the door open and your hedge against the risk of the Army being too small. Have the Marine Corps shed the function of sustained ground combat, put that into the Army and put it into, change the balance between the active and reserve in the Army. So a big pot of your wrist rests on the Marine Corps not just to be the force that can kick the door open, but that can buy you time for the mobilization of what we can't afford to keep in the end strength of the Army, but we could quickly mobilize. Where else would I accept risk? Reduce training with foreign forces. Um, I don't think we get nearly as much for that as, uh, as the Pentagon leadership seems to think we get. And I think we're also underestimating the downside risk, most recently visible in Mali, where units and officers we train overthrow a democratic government. Um, third place I would take it is I would shift a lot more risk onto allies. That both in Europe and in Asia, in particular in the case of South Korea, but also in the case of Japan, our allies have grown astronomically more capable over the last 30 years, and yet our, our balance of responsibilities between us and them has not. Um, now is a good time to have conversations about allies taking a lot more responsibility for the outcomes in their own countries. Um, and less, so the proof of whether any of this happens will be whether we see straight line slices in the budget, so the preservation of the service shares, because whether um, the pivot to the Pacific has any, me if, if it is to have any meaning at all, Actually, there are huge budget consequences for it. And the people who would, should win the budget uh, deal if the strategy, if the administration is serious about the strategy, are the Navy and the Marine Corps. Um, and, but, and my closing note is that you are also the place where the greatest amount of risk is going to be shifted because uh, if 
you don't have straight slices across the service, then a lot more responsibility is going to fall to the Navy and the Marine Corps for the execution of the strategy. All right. Thank you very much, panelists. And now uh, we've got uh, about 25 minutes or so for questions uh, from the uh, audience. So uh, if you have one, uh, step up to one of these mics and we'll uh, entertain it. Yes, sir. I'm Lyle Bien. Is this is it working? Yep. I'm Lyle Bien, former sailor. Uh, those are really, really, truly uh, compelling comments by all four of you. Congratulations. Um, but you lost me on the math. Uh, when I, I'm old enough to have lived through some of these transitions in the past, not all the way to World War II, but Korea and uh, Vietnam and the Cold War. And if I use your numbers, you, the services numbers, the reduction after each of those averaged somewhere between 15 and 20 percent is the historical drawdown. In this instance, in the worst case, we're talking about half of that. So if the reduction this time, after coming off a substantial high as a result of the wars in the Middle East, is half of what we've historically had, why this time, not suggesting that those prior instances weren't painful, but they were not death knells. What I'm hearing from the service chiefs now, if we take half of what we've historically taken, we're going to, the ship is going to run aground. Where's, I'm losing something in the math. Maybe Corey's comments about we are dealing with a fundamentally different department now, perhaps. But somewhere along the line, the numbers don't add up for me. I would, um, first of all, uh, as far as the math goes, what, what the audience has to remember is that there were two principal pots of money used since 9-11. You had the baseline budget for each of the services, and then you had the uh, contingency funds, the OCO funds, as they call them. And what you essentially have out there is, for a period of a decade, uh, you have operated in a, with a baseline and an OCO. So as was alluded to earlier, we've had an entire generation of um, budgeteers and programmers who grew up with, uh, there was always this safety valve called uh, OCO, or contingency funds, and it was to cover the war and the expenses. Where the, where the concern comes in is, at, over time, has that in fact grayed at all? Has, that, uh, has, has the funding become, what is OCO and what is base? That's part of the issue that you're dealing with. Uh, the second part is, as you, as, if you look at the numbers and you compare 2001 and then run your budgets up, you'll see you are fighting two land wars. The budgets were growing exponentially, but the, the amount of the, the actual cost was uh, great because you had both the baseline and the OCO dollars out there. So when the tip over occurred, which we initially expected was going to occur around 2010, but then that was delayed by the uh, surge uh, strategy. Uh, what happened was, as those do dollars now start to come down, you see that you, you've got a blending of the base and the OCO, what's in base and what's in OCO. The other piece that's playing with it now is the, the commitment for the Navy in particular, or, or I can only speak to the Navy, has not gone down. All right, uh, as, the, as the wars have drawn down, the Navy commitment worldwide has not, all right? There is still a demand signal from all the COCOMs to push those forces out there. So the question to, the, uh, to, to the, both the Hill and to the services and to OSD will be, all right, what are we going to be able to supply to the COCOM demand signal based on the dollars we get? And that's where I think the, when the service chiefs talk, they say, all right, if, if the war is coming to an end, then the demand signal for naval forces should be going down, but it's not. And as a result, you have got uh, that disconnect that's occurring out there. Uh, the best example I can give you, just this year alone, you know, we, we, uh, we pushed the uh, additional mine forces into theater. We pushed PCs into theater. Uh, we've got the uh, second carrier presence over in theater. So you've got all those occurring, and those costs are not dropping down. We're not, we're not seeing the numbers go down. And that's where, uh, for the CNO, that's where his concern is. If you're going to drop the dollars down, then you've got to drop my demand, the demand that comes in from the, uh, from the field down as well, and we're not seeing that. 
If I could build on, on the Admiral's remarks, I think that was a fair question. The, the questioner was essentially saying that in prior defense downturns, the top line has come down uh, by roughly a third. And what we're talking about with sequestration is uh, eight or nine percent. So why is that so difficult? And I think the answer has to do with the abruptness of the change. The 30 percent reductions in the defense top line that occurred uh, in previous defense spending cycles were accomplished over a period of 10 years. So in any one year, the percentage reduction in the defense budget was fairly mild. Uh, this year, we are looking at the possibility with sequestration of an abrupt, uh, immediate 8 to 9 percent reduction in spending that would occur five months into the fiscal year. And so you would be absorbing uh, uh, that much reduction on seven months remaining in a fiscal year, which is something equivalent to you know, like a 16 or 18 percent reduction on an annualized basis. Furthermore, that abrupt reduction would occur possibly against uh, a situation where you were already operating under a CR that created certain uh, funding shortages and program misalignments, and so that would also tend to exacerbate it. Now, could the Defense Department get down to uh, the lower line in the Budget Control Act eventually? Yes. Would they need to change their strategy to do that? They've said they would need to. DOD could live at that lower number and execute a different strategy than what we have today, and as a nation, it's uh, a matter of debate and deliberation as to whether uh, we would like that strategy or not. Uh, so the question is a fair one, but it has to do with the time frame. Uh, could defense spending go down by an amount cumulatively similar to what happened uh, in past defense spending cycles? And could DOD eventually live at that lower level? Yes. But the uh, problems that were being discussed by the panel here have to do with the abruptness of the change that would occur uh, five months into the fiscal year that we're already executing. Yeah, I, I think that that goes back to the, the point that was made earlier by one of the panel members where, all right, uh, are we going to continue along the one-third, one-third, one-third salami slice approach, or are we going to take it in another direction uh, in which you say, all right, based on the strategy that you have, you then have to reallocate uh, the dollars based on the strategy. And I think that that's going to be up to Congress. Uh, that is where the, the debate is going to take place. So. To, to build on, on the Admiral's uh, answer a little, a little bit further, it's not my role to, to comment on the, on the tactics of how to provide political cover from one branch to another, but I will observe, just as a matter of noticing what has occurred, that the issue of uh, personnel pay and benefits is on the table now in a way over the last year or two that I had not and most people had not seen it on the table in, in the decade prior to that. So the, the issue has been opened. It is something that people are discussing. And that is a change from the situation that we had up until a year or two ago. And just to be clear, I didn't mean that pejoratively. I didn't no. say we I too would like to add a word on that because, um, you know, H.L. Mencken uh, once said that Congress consists of roughly one third liars, roughly two thirds villains, and roughly three thirds cowards, or you know, something along those lines. Uh, if we leave to Congress to make the hard choices about defense policy, they're not going to make hard choices about defense policy. We as a defense community need to establish what we think the least bad answers are and then give Congress the political cover to do it, exactly as you suggested. Nobody can do that quite like the uniformed military can do that, right? Because they're the people who, most, who are most affected by the choices. I personally don't think you are going to get significant cuts to the personnel accounts unless the service chiefs go up to Capitol Hill and say, Unless we do this, we are going to have a well-paid Navy that doesn't have ships to sail. Um, and that, excuse me, that would give them credit. Three places that I also think are ripe for picking of changes within the, within the infrastructure and personnel accounts that are overdue for changes. First, base closures. Um, we still have probably a 30 percent overhang of installations that the services would like to get rid of in many instances. And Congress, in fact, Panetta, when he submitted his last budget, one of his big bill payers was on the notion that we were going to get base closures. 
which you only ever get after lots of intensive hand-holding with Congress. So to just put it in there and expect that Congress is going to do it really proves your point, that it doesn't happen unless you prepare the ground, you make it safe, you make it essential to what's happening. Base closure is the place we can do that. Second, tailoring of benefits, that different service members value different benefits in different ways. And most businesses that are serious about their human capital, um, you know, I live and work in Silicon Valley. This is a place that takes uh, talent poaching quite seriously. And one of the ways that they protect their talent base is by figuring out what I want and making sure that there's an HR package that does that. We could actually collect that information. My guess is that 18-year-old Marines care less about child welfare benefits than they do about a base exchange where they can buy stereos. I could be wrong about that, but we could figure it out and we could tailor their packages so that Marines who spend two tours aren't paying for the retirement of folks who spend 20 years in the service and aren't getting any of the benefits of that. We could do this. We know how to do it. Businesses in the private sector do it all the time. We just haven't done it. Um, and I'll stop there. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, my name is Dave Grober. My name is David Grober. My question actually comes in an area uh, that's a little di bit different. Uh, we've got, as we know, not enough engineers to uh, keep us moving forward as we need to. So my question has to do with education in STEM, and that comes from the fact that I actually come out of the motion picture industry, um, and I invented a camera stabilization system, won an Academy Award. So in technology, and I was um, hired with a couple of other people by ONR to create a seed funder to create a STEM robotics program, nautical-based, for high school students. So my question basically comes, and it's called Porpoise Robotics, and we're actually downstairs. Um, my question to you is, in all this sequestration and all the rest of it, is will giving ourselves a robust STEM educational program help us cut costs in the future by having a more capable young engineering workforce, or do you think it will not make any difference, or in worst case, exacerbate the budget crisis? Let me try that from a, both my Navy background and, and my current industry background. Uh, and I happen to be a member of ASNE, so we're also very interested in growing young engineers on behalf of the government. So yes, the government has always had a need and an interest in having engineers that understand the technology and can take advantage of it and shape industry and, and needs that. I, I was an engineering duty officer, so I became one of those guys. I was never engineered you know, as a young kid, but it became interesting to me because we were shooting rockets out of Cape Canaveral. It was fun to watch on, on TV, at least, and that was kind of exciting to me. So finding a way to get young kids at an age where they find interesting the the, the the tools and, and, and possibilities in engineering is vitally important, not just from a military point of view. It is, it is vitally important for the nation as an industrial base. I look at my industry, we look at the large number of people that we train and bring together. We need those engineers, not just in the IT industry, but robotics and, as you mentioned, uh, all in, in chemistry and bio, bioengineering. Uh, if we don't interest them at a young age, they leave. So who comes to this country and gets trained in it? People from foreign countries. Uh -huh. And they leave and go back. And so we have this dearth of, of engineering talent who really understands what the cutting edge technologies can do. And we, we lack that both in, in, the, uh, in the military side and in the, uh, in, in the industry side. So I think the challenge is the same. Would I support it? Do, do, do industry partners support it? Not enough in my estimation. And so I'll take the burden off of the government guys for the moment. We need to do more of that. And, and it's largely volunteer, so thank you for helping in that, in that regard. To, to extend that just a little bit, I'm glad you brought that question in, actually, because it allows me to say something that I had written down and I left off my presentation for purposes of brevity. As a general principle, I think there's widespread support among policymakers for STEM education and for uh, increasing the number of uh, uh, engineer uh, skilled people that we're training. Uh, but one of the consequences uh, uh, again of the, this ticking budget clock is that the people who come out of those programs then uh, have very good choices uh, about where they might find themselves employed and if they witness a defense world that is subject to periodic 
uh, significant perturbations because of uh, budget actions, uh, that could influence their decision about whether they want to take that education that's been given to them and apply it to the defense world when in fact there are an awful lot of non-defense uh, employment uh, opportunities that they could have. So one of the other uh, implications of this uh, uh, ticking budget clock, one of the other uh, ways in which we can answer the question of what does it mean is that it could influence the decision of young people about whether to get into the defense world, the talented young people that would be coming out of these programs, because they'll have other options. I'll like to have one last, or take you in a different direction. We just had a long discussion about what happens in budget, and, the, and there was a great discussion about what happens inside of the political machinery. We need a civics version of STEM someplace for young kids and people to understand how government works and the complications of it, because that lack of understanding, in my personal opinion, drives an inability to, to, to make and, and be willing to have the Congress and the government work in directions that are useful for the nation at large. So somewhere out there we need a civics version of that. And I think we've lost that. It would be valuable for the country as a whole. So unpaid political announcement, thanks. Yeah, let me offer an amen to that one. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would tell you, over the last three years, in the time I was the, uh, the aide on the staff, um, the STEM program was one of our priorities. And I would tell you that as even, even the dollars have been coming down for the last three years, uh, that we recognized uh, that we had to continue to uh, fund that program. But at the same time, I'd also tell you, uh, industry also benefits from that. And I don't, we can't do it alone. We have to do it in partnership with industry. Uh, we, can, we cannot uh, divert uh, all the dollars that would probably be needed to make that effective and efficient uh, out of our program alone. We have to have partners uh, doing is, it with is us. Is industry in partnership formed any sort of formal association to uh, look at this look at this area you know that would that would be an in one's lane I mean I'm just a I'm just a programmer budgeteer you know I just I just put the dollars where they go I don't uh, I don't necessarily dig down into all these programs and believe me he doesn't want me digging around in them I mean we're, we're kind of okay. uh, uh, dependent on uh, local initiatives we have a, a local initiative up at the Newport at the Naval War College. One of my faculty members has taken upon himself to work uh, locally. Uh, the Naval Aviation Museum uh, down there has uh, Starship at Flats. I think it's there. No, uh, they have an incredible new facility there. There are local initiatives, but I don't know that we have anything systemic across okay. the board. I guess I just so just throwing the issue out and uh, just disclosing the collection. Question here is that. Um, you know, just the thought of people to begin to bubble around in their heads is if working on STEM in those areas will actually help our budget crisis issues in the future. It's not, not so that was kind of the question. Thank you all. I think we have time for one more here. Sir. Good morning. My name is Vince Wade. I'm a freelance uh, reporter and video producer. I want to ask the panel uh, about this uh, pivot or rebalance to the Pacific and what that might mean in terms of the budget. Uh, it's geographically inconvenient um, in, in, terms of, in terms of personnel and being able to be on scene. Uh, and, and so clearly it's going to be a Navy Marine kind of a, kind of a thing. But our, our ally uh, pool, if you will, ranges from Japan to the Philippines where they're excited that they were able to buy a Coast Guard cutter. Uh, and so I'd, I'd like to find out what the panel thinks about in this constrained budget environment, what, what does this pivot rebalance in real terms, in the real world, going to mean or, or may mean? So, I, so I'm tossing it out to the whole panel. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start since I'm the guy in uniform. Um, I would tell you that if there's a chart that the CNO uses, and he puts it up and he shows where the forces currently are, where they're positioned, it shows where they're going to be positioned in five years, where, they, where were they projected to be positioned in ten years. And what you see, if you look at just the numbers of ships, aircraft, personnel, you will see that there is a shift to the Pacific, where there are more assets available to be employed by the COCOMs in the uh, Pacific and the Middle East region. And so that is the essence of what we are doing as far as the rebalance goes. I would also bring you back to a point that uh, Admiral Winnefeld uh, said this morning in that some of the rebalances are not 
uh, expensive. Uh, by that I mean, yes, you, you do have uh, high visibility events such as uh, uh, Home, forward home porting ships or uh, rotational crewing. But, uh, but again, uh, not everything that you're going to do is going to cost you a lot more dollars. And so what we have to find is we have to find those efficiencies. I mentioned rotational crewing where we actually, you know, we take the, uh, the PCs, uh, the patrol coastal vessels that are over in the Middle East and the mine sweeps, and we rotationally crew those. And that's that's an efficiency. So you get more presence, and it doesn't co it co does cost you some money. I mean, it, nothing's free. There's no free lunch, but uh, you're not buying a five star meal. Uh, and we're able to do things like that. So it, when we do the rebalance, I think you'll see that there's an actual shift in assets, but not necessarily every one of them is going to be a big ticket item. As a former NMC guy, and I watched uh, PEO, IWS, and PEO ships, and so Terry, if you'll back. Or, or tell me if I got this wrong. Uh, my first tour in the Navy was five years home ported overseas in Japan on destroyers and cruisers. Forward deployment is a great way to put presence forward. The thing that's different today, when I remember what we what NFC was doing, is when you look at the forces that Japan and Korea, the naval forces that they have in place, they are aegis, they are qualified, they are capable. They are incredibly powerful forces. And if you can f keep that alliance together and their willingness to deploy, the ability to project our interests, which are in combination with their interests, forward and keep that forward is, is way more powerful today than it was in the 70s when I was sitting overseas getting every, you know, every job that needed to be done. So a, as a private citizen now, when I look forward, and I don't think we tell that story enough, the, the rebalance to the Pacific not only is a projection <coughs> of American force, but is a projection of incredibly capable f allied forces that, that can be mustered on our behalf if we keep those alliances together. In ways, um, the, the the notion of forward home porting into Guam with the submarines, uh, ways we can keep things forward in a way that uh, having the backup forces here that can can surge forward if necessary are, are incredibly different than they were from the 70s and the 80s. There are people in the audience who can talk about that in way more detail and and with maybe more authority than me. But just as an observer now, some years later. Your question was what this may mean for the budget. At the inter-service level, it is generally expected that the strategic rebalancing toward the Pacific will, at the margin, result in a somewhat larger share of DOD's resources going to uh, the Navy and, to some degree, the Air Force. Uh, not a wholesale change, but at the margin. Uh, within the Navy, Navy officials have made it clear that uh, it means that uh, uh, resources will be again shifted at the margin more toward that region and away from others. The Navy is committed to having 60 of percent of its ships assigned to the Pacific by the year 2020. They're fairly close to that percentage now. Uh, and they've also stated that in a budget reduction environment, the Asia Pacific region would in effect get priority at the expense of other regions. And that was made clear by the contents of the CNO memo that was released uh, over the weekend. So rising powers are destabilizing in the international order, and if China continues to rise at the rate it has in the past 15 years, um, we are going to be looking at a dramatically different cast of influence throughout Asia. And um, the, I think the last three administrations have actually had a pretty solid strategy for managing a rising China, which is to try and persuade it that it's in China's interests to opt into the international order, that they will be prosperous and powerful if they play by the rules that have made the rest of us successful, and to hedge against that China not emerging and uh, China remaining a repressive government, remaining a source of concern for its neighboring states. Um, by strong American military presence in the Pacific, by an increasingly active trade policy and an increasingly active diplomatic policy. I think we have not yet seen those latter two planks of the policy come to fruition in the way they should. But if you get the political framework right, managing the rise of China um, can actually be enriching for us all and not least for the Chinese. But I think they are hedging against the rise of a bad China, which would be extraordinarily expensive for us to deal with in all sorts of ways, by doing good long-term management along the way now. So I think its budget implications are, in the near term, 
perhaps a marginal increase in spending, but at, at preserving uh, the ability not to have to spend quite a lot to manage the emergence of a powerful and destabilizing and dangerous China, both to us and to its neighbors. Okay. Uh, I think we've uh, run out of time here. Uh, I want to thank the panelists. Uh, this has been an extraordinarily lucid uh, dialogue, both from the panelists and, and the audience. Uh, I've learned a lot and enjoyed it, and thank you very much. General,